The former Soviet Union is a nation shrouded in mysteries and atrocities that date back to its inception. It was a frightening superpower that engaged in illicit experiments that were on par with those carried out by the Nazis and the Japanese during the Second World War. These experiments range from human-chimp hybrids to the production of the Novichok nerve agent. However, ordinary citizens of the state occasionally found themselves as unwilling participants in these top-secret studies. How did six members of a seven-person hiking group die mysteriously on a mountain range in southern Siberia? No, we are not talking about the Dyatlov Pass incident, but another mysterious and tragic Russian mountaineering incident. The Kamar Daban incident. This mystery is no closer to being solved than it was in 1993, and the Russian government has not declassified any documents related to the event either. Join us as we walk in the steps of the ill-fated mountaineers, explore the theories and reach a conclusion about what most likely happened in the Kamar Daban incident. Peers and pupils referred to 41-year-old Lyudmila Korovina as a master because she was an experienced hiking instructor and survivalist. She was renowned for her tough love approach to her pupils and frequently pushed them to perform at their best. This tough love paid off as all her pupils described her as an excellent instructor who instilled a sense of confidence and essential hiking skills in them. In the summer of 1993, Korofina scheduled a hike in the Kamar Daban mountain range with six students. She was intimately acquainted with the area, a popular tourist destination and a secure hiking location, particularly during summer. Her pupils were close acquaintances and she had prepared them well for the excursion. Alexander Sasha Kreisen, aged 23, was the closest to Korovina. She had known Sasha for most of his life and regarded him as a son. The other five pupils were 24-year-old Tatiana Filipenko, 19-year-old Denis Shvachkin, 17-year-old Valentina Utachenko, 16-year-old Victoria Zelosova, and 15-year-old Timur Bapanov. The party of seven reached the base of the mountain range on the 2nd of August 1993. The weather forecast for the day was ideal and promised clear, sunny skies. Korovina and her pupils were one of three hiking groups in the area. Natalia, Korovina's daughter, led one of the other groups. The two parties planned to meet on the 5th of August when their respective hiking routes intersected. All six students had been preparing and anticipating this excursion for months and excitedly made their way up the mountain. The first two days of the hike were uneventful, with the group ascending the Retranslieta peak quickly. On the 4th of August, however, as they began their descent, the weather forecast turned out to be inaccurate, and they were abruptly struck by a tremendous rainstorm. With their gear drenched, the hikers were slowed down by the additional water weight in their belongings. The hikers were fatigued, so Korovina set up camp in an exposed area, despite the adjacent tree cover. Additionally, they could not start a fire to dry themselves and their supplies. They were able to start a fire the following morning and ate breakfast together before departing for the day. Given how rapidly they had climbed the mountain the previous day, they anticipated that they would be able to meet up with Natalia in time. Later that day, Natalia and her group arrived at the designated meeting location but her mother had not arrived yet. She was unconcerned about her mother because she assumed that poor weather had delayed the group's progress. Sadly, what had set the group back was significantly worse than Natalia could have ever anticipated. On the 10th of August, a group of kayakers paddling through a river at the base of the mountains noticed something in the tree line. A young girl stood alone on the bank of the river, staring at them. The kayakers disembarked, and upon approaching her, they saw that she was covered in crusted blood. The girl became hysterical while attempting to recount her horrifying tale to the kayakers. 
Eventually, she identified herself as Valentina Utachenko and said she had been hiking with six others. Terrified, the kayakers rushed Valentina to the nearest police station so she could file a report. However, it was not until years later that she could gradually recount the mysterious and horrifying tale of what happened to the other six hikers. According to Valentina, after eating breakfast that morning, the party made their way down the mountain, but the first terrifying event occurred within minutes. Suddenly, Sasha, who was walking at the very back of the group, let out a piercing scream. When everyone turned to see why, they saw he was hemorrhaging from his eyes, ears, and mouth. He collapsed to the ground in convulsions before becoming still. Koravina rushed to him and instructed the remainder of the party to continue walking. She was in utter shock as she struggled in vain to bring Sasha back to consciousness. The remaining members of the party did not walk far before hearing Koravina's cries. As they turned and dashed towards her, they saw she was experiencing the same symptoms as Sasha. Her eyes and nose were dripping with blood, and her mouth was foaming. She convulsed violently before collapsing onto Sasha. Tatiana, who had reached Koravina first, was the next to collapse, clutching her throat as if she could not breathe. She inched her way over to a nearby rock and smashed her head against it until she was rendered unconscious. Timur and Victoria both ran away while Denise hid behind a boulder. Valentina was paralyzed with shock as she witnessed three of her friends die within minutes. Victoria and Timur both collapsed while running and died in a similar manner to the rest, vomiting blood and gripping at their own throats while ripping off their clothing. Upon realizing they were the only ones left, Valentina and Denise sprinted to one another and ran away from the area where their friends had unexpectedly and inexplicably died. However, it was not long before Denise also collapsed into violent convulsions. Valentina fled in fear for her life, leaving the corpses of her fellow travelers behind. Her only supplies were a tent and the clothes on her back. Valentina hurried down the mountain until she knew she was far from the horrors she had just witnessed. Under tree cover, she set up the shelter for the night and fell asleep. Valentina realized upon awakening that she would need supplies to survive alone in the wilderness. To retrieve them, she would have to confront the trauma of returning to the site of her friend's deaths. Realizing she had no other option, Valentina retraced her steps back up the mountain. When she arrived at the scene, she saw that none of the bodies had moved from where they had fallen. Valentina quickly grabbed the supplies she needed from their bodies and followed the power lines back to civilization. She followed the power lines down the mountain for four days, hoping that someone would find her, until she discovered a river and began to follow it. At the end of the fourth day, the kayakers spotted her and brought her to safety. Despite the police report, no official search was conducted until the 24th of August. Since Valentina had not yet provided her account of the events, it took two days for helicopters to locate the bodies. Except for Koravina, who died of a heart attack, the autopsies concluded that all the victims died from hypothermia. They all had indications of bruised lungs, and a protein deficiency due to malnutrition was listed as a contributing factor to their deaths. The deaths were deemed accidental by authorities. Compared to Valentina's testimony, this ruling was unusual, and it appeared there was some type of cover-up. Those who have investigated this incident have put forward multiple theories due to its mysterious nature. As with any unusual occurrence, these hypotheses range from extraterrestrial and paranormal to scientifically plausible explanations. The hikers witness something they should not have. This theory suggests that the hikers may have stumbled upon a Russian military experiment in the mountains and were killed due to what they saw. 
Consequently, the police and medical examiners suppressed information crucial to solving the cause of their deaths. The group deviated from the region's typical route, so it is conceivable that this deviation led them to a group of experimenters unprepared for visitors. Despite this, this hypothesis has two major flaws. The location where the hikers died and Valentina's survival. The Kamardaban Mountains are a popular tourist destination in the summer, with numerous tourist groups passing through at any moment. Siberia provides innumerable locations for secrecy, so it would be odd for a top-secret experiment to be conducted in a public location during the tourist season. In addition, the mountain region where the hikers died was an open area that could be seen from the air and higher ground. It makes no sense for a top-secret mission worth murdering a group of hikers for to be in this section of the Kamar Daban Mountains. A neurotoxin killed the hikers. Multiple people have noted that the group's symptoms are consistent with death by chemical weapons, specifically nerve agents. Notably, the foaming at the mouth and the convulsions are consistent with death by a potent nerve agent. This type of death matches the autopsy results as well. Since nerve agents can induce respiratory distress, bruising of the lungs can indicate mortality caused by nerve gas. It is possible that nerve agents caused Koravina's cardiac arrest, which would make sense given the circumstances of her death. Even if they were exposed to a nerve toxin, the other climber's cause of death may have been hypothermia, as they may have been rendered comatose or lapsed into a coma before dying of exposure. Some amateur investigators have hypothesized that the nerve agent that killed the hikers was Novichok gas. Novichok gases are a category of nerve agents developed by the Soviet Union until 1993. They are believed to be the most lethal nerve agents known to exist, as they are 10 times deadlier than VX and 20 times more toxic than sarin. Novotok nerve agents were reportedly tested near the Kamar Daban region, and like what the hikers experienced, exposure to this substance causes rapid death rates. This theory also contains a few gaping logical flaws. How did Valentina make it through the ordeal? She was present when her colleagues died, and even returned to the scene without experiencing the same fate. The second flaw in this theory is, where the gas came from if no one was around to release it. But could there be more credence to this theory? Keep watching and we'll tell you more. Valentina's account was inaccurate. When someone undergoes a traumatic experience, they frequently incorrectly recall specific details, especially when recounting the event years later, as Valentina did. Due to no fault of her own, she may have exaggerated certain aspects of the narrative. Extensive and alarming research has been conducted regarding the weakness of eyewitness accounts. The unquestioning approval of eyewitness accounts may originate from a common misunderstanding of how memory functions. Many people believe that human memory functions like a video recorder. The mind records events and then, on command, plays back an exact replica of them. In contrast, psychologists have discovered that each time we recall a memory, it is reconstructed rather than replayed. Did Valentina inadvertently cherry-pick details and piece them together to create an inaccurate account? Water contamination. This theory proposes that the hikers ingested toxins in their water after the rainstorm transported these toxins to the area. Lake Baikal, situated atop the mountains, is a notorious hazardous waste repository. If this waste had been carried downstream and into the water, the hikers could have accidentally consumed lethal contaminants in their breakfasts. The pollutants may have been a water-soluble nerve agent, consistent with the theory of nerve agents. Valentina may have survived by consuming less water or obtaining water from an alternative source to the other hikers. Since most highly toxic substances take a few minutes to take effect, the hikers died within minutes of each other but not immediately after absorbing the substance. 
Like the nerve agent theory, this toxin may have rendered the six unconscious, causing them to succumb to hypothermia before dying from the toxin. Depending on the toxin, it may not have been reflected in a typical toxicology report. This theory is flawed since the fatalities were isolated. If a water source used by numerous tourists was so severely contaminated, it is illogical that only one group would be affected. Misidentified Mushrooms Coravina was a well-known forager who taught her students the craft. There is a possibility that one of the six misidentified poisonous mushrooms and added them to their breakfast. After eating their breakfast, the effects of the mushroom poisoning started to set in, causing them to hallucinate and make them sick as they walked. Valentina could have survived by consuming fewer mushrooms, having a tolerance or even just a genetic disposition to be less affected, sporting warmer clothing, or escaping to the forest and seeking shelter out of anxiety. What most likely happened to the ill-fated climbers? In this case, one of the theories may have some substance. Nerve agents are soluble in water, can take up to four months to evaporate, and are composed of heavy particles that float close to the ground. The more potent ones can continue to pose a threat in areas where they have been used for up to 50 years after their initial release. The rainstorm that the group encountered is pivotal to what most likely happened. The rain could have washed a powerful nerve agent, most likely Novichok or VX, that had been tested four or five months before the incident in a more secluded area of the mountains, down to the hill where the unfortunate hikers were located. As the morning sun evaporated water from the rainstorm, some of the still hazardous agent evaporated along with it. However, it did not travel far, remaining in pockets close to the ground. Sasha stumbled upon a highly contaminated area first, causing almost instantaneous symptoms. He may have absorbed the poison through his skin or while breathing. Coravina was exposed to the same toxic pocket when she ran to him. Tatiana, Victoria and Timor were the first to reach Coravina after her panicked screams, but they ran in the opposite direction immediately, smelling or feeling that they had inhaled something toxic. This prolonged their lives slightly. Since Valentina avoided contact with Coravina, she was not exposed to high toxin levels. Denise was initially unaffected, but his undoing was his decision to hide and crouch behind the boulder. He could have inhaled smaller amounts of toxin floating close to the ground. His death was slightly delayed because he was exposed to less than the other five. As a cover-up, the Russian police, informed by those responsible for the tests, suspecting that runoff from the test could have been the cause of the deaths, waited to begin their search until most of the nerve agent had dissipated before dispatching a team of recovery personnel. It is common knowledge that the Russian government has a propensity for producing and using nerve agents. The production and safety of these highly toxic agents are not foolproof. In May 1987, while working in a laboratory in Moscow, Andrei Zelesnikov was unintentionally exposed to a Novichok agent, demonstrating its lethal effects on humans. After the incident, it took him 10 days to regain consciousness due to his severe injuries. The agent caused permanent damage, including chronic weakness in his arms, a toxic hepatitis that gave rise to cirrhosis of the liver, epilepsy, spells of severe depression, and an inability to read or concentrate that left him totally disabled and unable to work. He never recovered and died in July 1992 after five years of deteriorating health. This is what happened in a controlled laboratory setting. Imagine their effects where there is no control. If you love our content and want to support the channel, feel free to check our web shop where you can find exclusive true crime merch brought to you by Bad Things.